Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit Photo with Catherine Hall and Leo Laporte. Episode 25, recorded September 20th, 2011. Steve Simon. Twit Photo is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Twit Photo, and I'm so glad you're here because we're going to have a lot of fun today. Let's first welcome Catherine Hall from CatherineHall.net, our great photographer, our champion of the great image, and a host of the show. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Leo. You look fantastic today. Thanks for being here. Today. Thanks for being here, everyone. Yeah. Super excited. Let's start. Uh, we're, we're, who's our guest? And then before we get to him, I want to show your blog a little bit. But who's our guest? So we. I'm so honored and excited to have Steve Simon here today. I've been admiring his work. You mean the passionate photographer? The passionate, the passionate photographer. That's exciting. The one and only. That's exciting. Um, I've been watching his work since in college is when I started following it. And it's, it's a big deal to have you here. I'm so excited. Oh, so and excited. This is talked great. to him yesterday. He's a great guy. So he's going to be a great guest. So we'll talk about being passionate about your art and how to make better photographs in just a second. But, you know, one of the things Catherine does on our website, CatherineHall.net, uh, every day, uh, you post a portrait of the week. Look at that. Isn't that great? And uh, you have, uh, you talk about things that you're up to. Yeah. You so have contests. We do. And that, I, if we go back to the portrait of the week, the, I wanted to highlight that really quick. Um, I think entering contests has been... I'm going to move your mic up a little bit. Thank you. we got to really tape it to you, except that the tape is so unsightly. You can tape it. <laughs> this All is right. a picture of a guy doing yoga, obviously. Yeah, that's at Burning Man. You can tell by the feet. Oh, his feet are all covered yeah. in alkali. Yeah. Um, but contests have been a huge thing for me in my career, and they've definitely helped me get a lot of exposure that I otherwise wouldn't have gotten. So this image in particular was um, published in National Geographic Traveler. Oh, that's great. From entering a contest. And you don't so, do it for the prize money. You do it for no, the exposure. No, it's, it's not about the prizes. And for the feedback. Prizes frankly. are great, Yeah. but it's really about getting your work out there and getting it published in a magazine. That's worth a lot more than, say, a gadget or a camera or you, I agree. you know, a I point agree. shoot or something like that. Um, so this was back when you were an assistant. I notice it yes. says Hall, an assistant for professional photographers. So you were a young, I was working for Steve McCurry, at starting time. A photographer when you took this yes, picture. Yes, I was. Isn't that great? So anyway, I, in in honor of that, I want to really help other photographers. And so we host contests with Catherine Hall Studios, um, and the most recent one Look was the Muse contest. Wow. Isn't that gorgeous? That is an amazing. Um. So uh, these were. There was two winners um, and a voter's choice. This was Brenda's image on top was the, one of the winners. Oh, I and love then, that. Um, this is the had, voter's choice from yeah. Tamara. Well, though that's um, also one of the winners. Oh, and that's one of the winners. I've voter's heard. choice is underneath the third winner. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Mm. So it was really neat. Everyone talked about, the, I mean, it was an open contest. What's your muse? And In this case, PRX muse is travel. Yeah. yeah. So, and it was very open-ended. What inspires you? But really exciting to see all the work come in and come through. So Really fun. So, CatherineHall.net, you can find out more. The image of the week is there, but also uh, find out about contests and so forth uh, there. Is there, is there one contest that's the, the, like the king of the photographic contests? You know, I think there's a couple that are really consistent. Like PDN has a lot of contests, and getting in the magazine is really good. Um, PDN. They put, yeah, Photo District News. Okay. Um, that's American Photos had contests. Um, they're kind of all over. Sony has contests. So there's not really one particular one. If you're interested in photojournalism, I'm sure Steve knows about this, but Eddie Adams has, it's not really a contest, but it's a, I've talked about it before, but um, it's an entry for getting a scholarship to go study photography. So there's a lot of things out there. And the surprising thing is, I think, People don't realize what opportunities there are, and so a lot. Of, oftentimes, there's not even that many people entering, just because people don't know about it or they're just intimidated to try. So I, I can say one thing: I've 
a lot of the contests I've entered, um, I almost didn't enter because I didn't think I was going to do well. Right. So you just got to get your work out there. Just do it. Just try. It'll raise your, it'll raise your, uh, yeah. now let's get Steve Simon on yes. it. I'm at his website, which Please. just is amazing, stunning work. Steve Simon, uh, uh, photo.com. Steve, welcome to Twit Photo. I know our audience is probably familiar with you from uh, This Week in Photography, where you appear fairly regularly. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you guys for having me. So this format is a little different. Instead of us just kind of sitting around, John, we're going to put you on the spot. Yeah. We're going to talk it's to you. It's all on you. Find out how you be a passionate photographer. Bring it on. <laughs> I'm here. Um, I wanted to, before I forget, thank Van from Evangelos Photography for introducing me to Steve. And if it wasn't for him, he wouldn't be our guest today. So I wanted to recognize him and say thank you so much for that. Um, I thank appreciate you, all the guest suggestions out there. And I interrupted you. You said, thank you, Van. <laughs> yeah. I so how, so do, you, do you consider yourself um, a journalistic photographer? Is, are you a photojournalist? Is that your primary? Yeah, I, I kind of consider myself now, Leo, a, a documentary photographer because Ooh, I came up through photojournalism. Uh, for me, photojournalism is being in the media all the time, having your stuff published. And I came up through the newspaper world where, you know, every day is different. Uh, you're going to get your stuff out there to mass audiences uh, every day. Uh, of course, now that landscape is changing, and you know we have new ways of of reaching reaching our audience. But uh, as a documentary photographer, uh, I make the differentiation in that um, I'm working on more longer term projects, projects mm -hmm. that I hope to get published as books. Um, you know, occasionally excerpts will be published in magazines, but. Uh, it gives me a little bit longer time to spend on a story, uh, allows me to dig deeper, and ultimately uh, get better, better, more storytelling images. So you said when you moved to New York and you started doing this type of project, you said your career really started at this time. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, I think that uh, for me as a newspaper photographer, uh, it was just a tremendous experience because uh, every day, as I mentioned, was different. I was uh, forced to work really quickly, um, which was a blessing and a curse. Uh, a blessing in the sense that, uh, you know, it really made me uh, technically sharp because I had to be. Did you start with speed graphics and big flashes and, and that kind of thing? Yes, it was, it was very dangerous with flash powder, let me tell you. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> that stuff would burn. But you did start so in the film era, right? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, I started in film. I started in film. Can you see me? Do I look like a speed graphic? <laughs> I'm going to... I always wanted get, one of those, though. I'm going to get a little more rest, Smile I Smile at the birdie. No. <laughs> but uh, no, no, actually, um, I do have a speed graphic somewhere, just as kind of uh, uh, never got to, to use them. Those guys were amazing because they only had like one frame at a time. They had those spring-loaded things that maybe allowed, I think, five or eight. But you had to get the picture once. And, of you course, bet. in the digital age, uh, we, we can shoot, 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 and, you know, choose to delete if we, if we well, want. Well, and I notice in a, in a great many of your photojournalistic uh, efforts that it's the, it's the moment uh, that you capture. And uh, that's got to be easier uh, it, with digital photography to capture that just-so moment. Yeah, there, there's no question, Leo. You have to kind of... Uh, be there in advance of the moment mm -hmm. and hope that the moment happens. I mean, as a, as, a, as a photographer, I mean, you know, baseball players hit three out of ten and they're making millions of dollars and they're big stars. Uh, photographers, it's a similar numbers game to a certain degree, depending on, of course, the kind of uh, photography you're doing. But, um, yeah, I, I generally choose uh, subjects that have visual potential and then I put in the time and, uh, you know, sometimes the time is rewarded with great shots. Uh, other times it just doesn't quite work out. This is obviously one of those where you were in the right place at the right time. What? Yeah, that was at the Democratic Convention in 2008 uh, with Joe Biden uh, hugging his son. Yeah. Now you must so have known that you were going to, you, you positioned yourself for that shot or no? Uh, to, to, to the degree that you could. Uh, anybody that's been to a convention like that or any kind of organized event where there are literally thousands of people understand that there's, uh, you know, a lot of places where you can't be. Um, but I look at that as an advantage, frankly, because if, if I'm not always able to be in a bread and butter position, uh, I'm going to have a unique view from wherever I am. So mm -hmm. I'm going to try and make the most of that position by, you know, choosing the right equipment and, uh, you know, the right lens and then, you know, trying to get the, the moment when it happens. 
uh, kind of kind of an intimate moment at a big event with thousands of people. That's what I like about it. You see the crowd, but they disappear into the they background, disappear, yeah. and it's really about the father and the son, mm. and it's just very powerful. Oh, it, it, probably you're shooting in color here, though. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I you know now as a digital photographer, but even as a film photographer, I mean, we certainly looked at the world uh, you know in color through our viewfinder. So that hasn't really changed with digital. It's just I shoot a lot of stuff. I I. I I kind of make the decision that I'm going to go black and white in advance. I, oh, I try and let the subject matter dictate because, you know, for me, uh, black and white tends to cut to the content straight away. Uh, color, color can be uh, distracting and, mm -hmm. and actually, you know, more difficult, of course. Um, but I'll, I'll choose it uh, when I think that the subject matter is appropriate. Love this shot. So, are you? Do the same retouching rules apply for you as a documentary photographer versus a photojournalist? Yes, absolutely. I'm not. I'm not messing with the pixels. I'll. You know, I remember the dark room. You kids are too remember too young to remember the dark room. But I, I, I spent a lot of. Oh, I can't believe it. That's impossible. But uh, you know, you could you can make things darker, lighter. You know, correct the color. Dodge you know, and burn, right? Yeah. Dodge and burn. Dodge and burn. And and you know that that's really what the extent uh, to where I'll I'll go. I try and spend you know as little time as possible in front of the computer. I I'm an aperture guy. I I use aperture software. It does everything I need it to do. And uh, you know, so I so I can get back out shooting. Mm -hmm. you know, that's that's where the action is. So you started off as a shy guy. Um, how did you overcome that? Well, I think that, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of teaching and workshops, and I, I often ask uh, the class, you know, how many people would consider themselves to be shy? And often there's, you know, probably a majority of people raise their hands. Um, and we talked about this, Catherine. As, as photographers, uh, you know, we're observers. And I think when you're shy, Generally speaking, you you know, for me anyway, I tended to maybe stay kind of away from the action a little bit. Not necessarily by choice, but that's just was my nature. And because of it, I was able to observe, um, you know, life that was happening. And, and for me, the camera was kind of my ticket, my excuse to kind of leap into uh, the fray and, and meet people. And, and it really did kind of bring me out of my shell and it brought me... Uh, into all these extraordinary um, situations and experiences that I've had. So, you know, it's, it's been a blessing from the beginning, and it continues to be so. I think that's such a great perspective to have, because I know there's a lot of people out there that are intimidated or um, think, oh, I, I would love to shoot people, but I'm not made for it because I'm shy. Yeah, I'm one of them. And then you, you hear this, and you think, you know what, actually, that's, that's an advantage, because you're, if, like Steve said, if you're shy, you're naturally interested in your watcher mm. versus overtly yeah. being out there. So but you already have that skill. You, I, I watch you work, Catherine, and you're really good with people, and you're very effusive and friendly and gregarious, and you draw them into your sphere, and, and you make friends with them as, as you work, don't you? Isn't that Yeah, you? I do. And actually, I'm really curious, Steve, with you, your work, are you doing the same thing? Are you really... Is there much interaction with your subjects, or are you taking the more like shooting from the hip approach? Yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm. It depends, of course. Like the image on the screen now after 9/11. I mean, when when things are happening, I try and capture them as they happen. But because I tend to work with wide lenses, uh, generally because I find there's an intimacy that's communicated with a wide-angle mm -hmm. lens that is even kind of hard to articulate, but it's you know it when you see it. And when you're working wide, you you obviously get noticed. Um, but if, I'm, if I want to photograph people, I, if there's a character I meet that I would like to photograph, I generally don't ask if I can take their picture. I, I generally will go up with my camera on my neck. It looks like I'm a photographer. I've got a big camera. And, and I'll ask to talk to them because if they're willing to talk, uh, then I can sort of make my case as to, you know, if they're willing to maybe spend a little time with me. Because in order to get the images that I want to get, Rarely does it just happen with that, you know, can I take your picture, click. It's usually a time frame, a time period that I can spend because the image, you know, I don't show up at the, you know, the finished image. It's, it's just kind of, it, I, I see potential for it and I like to spend the time. The more time I spend, you know, the luckier I get. I'm know? guessing you took 100, 200, 300 images at this fire. <laughs> but boy, that's the one, right? I'm sure the minute you saw it, you went, 
I got it. Yeah. Do yeah. you know when you are, do you get that feeling or do you have to go back uh, and look at it? You know, th that's a very good point because I think we know as photographers with DSLRs, you know, when the mirror flips up for that moment that you take the picture, you kind of don't really see it, you know, that exact moment. And for me, um, I don't often really know. I turn my image review off because I don't like that screen popping up. I want to be able to concentrate mm -hmm. on my on what's happening, but I can easily, you know, just press the button if I want to see it. Um, but I, I don't always know. I just want to be shooting, and you know, with with my technique over the years, I've I've been able to shoot pretty fast. And uh, so later, I'll I'll look and and see if it's there. But uh, the other one thing I wanted to mention in my experience. Um, when I have a feeling that I didn't quite get it, you know that feeling, you probably don't have that feeling, but if you've ever had that feeling where you were shooting and you're not, you didn't feel like you really nailed it, in my experience, it's always true. When I feel that way, I didn't get it. So knowing that has been very powerful for me because it means that I just need to stay longer. I need to find a way to, to work a little harder. It's funny you should say that because Catherine was observing that. I think it was last show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're trusting your gut a lot in the sense of trusting it to know whether or not you've gotten the shot. Um, and then I'm assuming you're instinctual about capturing it as well. Yeah, I, I think that definitely that's uh, my process. And again, the only way, it, you know, it took time to get there, but really in order for it to happen, I had to really kind of... Uh, have my technique fade to the background so that I can work very, very quickly so that I could, you know, get the kind of things that I'm, I'm wanting. Because I'm most interested in kind of going out into the world and capturing little life slices uh, that are happening. And they're, they're happening all the time. I mean, there's no shortage of photo opportunities. If you really begin to look, I mean, around every corner, there's, there's something uh, that's worthwhile. So you said you're a documentarian, and so you work project why this America at the Edge would be an example. You were looking for a, a project that ex, that explained something. Told well, a story. I sort of yeah, I, I come up with an idea first, and then I go sort of see what happens with it. And America at the Edge was was one where, after years as a photojournalist, I was feeling frustrated because I didn't have time to spend on each assignment. I I noticed that. I was kind of the luster of photography was beginning to tarnish. I, I wasn't as passionate as I was. So I was looking for a project that I can just go out there and just feel free to just shoot and, and recapture kind of the, the passion that I had, uh, had always had really, uh, you know, throughout my photographic uh, life. So I decided that my project, America at the Edge, I was living in Canada at the time, and I decided that I would travel and my, the premise was, it's something I read by Margaret Atwood that described Canada becoming more like the United States. Mm -hmm. And I kind of agreed, so I thought, well, if I went to look <laughs> and see what the United States looked like closest to Canada. So I traveled oh, okay. Maine to Alaska, all the northern states, and I just kind of documented what I saw. So I had kind of that loose thread of the northern edge, and, uh, and that's what it was. So I just kind of you know, looked at stuff that uh, I thought was very different or very similar from my experience. It was, it was a fantastic thing. It, it really kind of launched my idea that I, I had to get out of the daily photojournalism and find another way to, to spend more time on projects. I got to point out, this image is absolutely worthy of Norman Rockwell. He could <laughs> not have, and you have to, wa you have to look at it a little bit to realize the kid on the right has a bandage under his eye. I know. His brother's got a BB gun, and he's looking at him as if don't shoot me again. And it's just, it's just a, it's one of those, and I've noticed uh, many of your images now, you're telling a story, and, an, and it's just amazing what you can encapsulate in one image. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, how are you, so say you have a million ideas for projects, which I'm sure you do, and many other photographers do, um, and other obligations in your life, whether it be work or other things that are paying the bills. How do you choose which projects to partake in, and what's your process with that? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Of course, I answer it, uh, all these questions I answer in my book, The Passion of Photography. Yes, of course. Which I, you know, I show, you know uh, I'm flogging, I guess. I'm no, sorry. we'll flog it for you. So. This is a it's great actually, book. actually, we'll digress yeah. for one second. The book is amazing. Uh, it's I, so concise. I'm, I'm running out to buy it today. Oh, oh yeah. Well. Thank you very much. I, yeah, I and we, we solicited questions for the show, and a lot of people are out there reading your book and are just feeling so inspired by it and so excited about it. So, well, 
Yeah, it I, makes I it didn't graspable. Re- yeah, I didn't really hold back. I mean, I basically just kind of, you know, told my story and and I've always, you know, been interested in, in teaching photography. I've always done it throughout my career. So for me, it was a natural kind of thing to do. But you asked about the project, and I think that it's, it's difficult. That's the one thing. You've got to kind of search and try and find something that you feel really strongly about. But it's also got to be uh, practical in that, you know, it, it's great to have an idea that you want to travel to Tahiti and document this. But you have to have something accessible to you. And, and I understand that most people have other things they're doing in their lives. So they want to find something they can spend time at that's local to them if they have any kind of connection and a place that they're either fascinated by, it scares them, or they love being there. I mean, there are many things I, I talk about to, to kind of, you know, ask yourself these questions in determining, you know, what kind of theme. It doesn't even have to be a project. It could be thematic. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a nature shooter, you can sort of focus it in a little bit. But my whole mantra for me personally has been um, when you find that one project and you dig deep, uh, you end up in a place that you can't even predict at the beginning. And the only way to really find out if it's going to work is to start shooting. I just, uh, again, I have to say, you know, we talk a lot on this show about... Um technique and composition and uh, but I can't think of a photographer we've had on who so exemplifies the idea of telling a story with an image yeah. as you do Steve I mean each of the this page alone just each of these images tells such a story um, it's just it's incredibly dramatic yeah. well thank you Leo just you know for the viewers out there I mean my process is even to get a single image I believe that you need to kind of work it and maybe try and tell a story because in my experience, um, when I'm in the field, sometimes I'll think I'm taking the picture that is the picture, but it, as it turns out, that wasn't the one that I ended up liking. Right. So I try not to really kind of make decisions, edit any decisions in the field. I try and, you know, kind of shoot everything that, that I feel is, is relevant. Well, as an example, all these photographers are looking at something else. You're shooting <laughs> the photographers, which I think makes an amazing image. And all the better because of this silhouette of the police officer yeah, here. Yeah. So what is yeah. your editing process? So you're, you're, getting, you're going to the shoot, you're getting different angles, various compositions, perspectives. What happens when you get back? Oh. Well, you know, usually I have, I do tend to overshoot. But you know what, I, as a newspaper photographer, the guys at the Edmonton Journal will tell you that uh, I, I was very prolific. I tended to overshoot <laughs> partly out of insecurity, I think, but also because I know that, you know, the moment, that moment can be very elusive. And I don't necessarily want to just keep the motor on it and, and just let the camera take the picture. I want to be there. But I, I just try not to think it too much once I'm in that sort of concentrating zone of shooting. I just like to kind of react and, and shoot a lot. And because of that, when I get back, I do have a lot of images to go through. So I, I like Aperture. That's the, my program of choice. I know Lightroom is similar. What I like about both those programs is their cataloging tools because as my archive grows, I need to be able to find a needle in a haystack, you know, three years from now right. if I've got like a million images. I love this. But These I, I are all with iPhone 3GS just to show you. It ain't the quality yes. of the camera. It's the quality of the photographer, right? Yeah. 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 Really cool. But I, I try when I edit, when I, my first look, I try not to, I try and really, for me, that first look is sacred because I want to be able to not mm. be interrupted. I need to concentrate. In some ways, editing can be more time consuming and more difficult. Um, and I maintain that ultimately any photographer is too close to the work. They need to have some second opinions uh, to get some, some help. But I'll go through all my stuff. I'll tag anything that I think is, is, is decent. And then the second edit, I'll usually go and I'll take my one stars and bring them up to two and three. And then from there, the, the, the fourth look, I'll, I'll single out my four stars and I'll save the five stars for the uh, portfolio images. But uh, Lightroom and Aperture both allow you to really find all those images. One thing I will tell your viewers that I have found to be increasingly important and that is to make your, th- your editing process thorough because three years from now, when I come back to look for an image from a job, I need to feel reasonably secure that I went through everything. Mm. And I don't have to do it all again because it, it just takes so much time. Yeah. I don't have time 
to go through another like 4,000 images. Do you talk about that process in the book? This book, I have to say, I'm really impressed. I mean, this is for even the most beginning photographer. You talk about aperture priority. You talk about shutter speed, RAW versus JPEG. This is not, you know, this, is, this has a lot of very basic and good uh, instructional stuff. But do you talk about, this is something I really need help with, this workflow process of how to, how to get through your images and, yeah. uh, and, and really trust what you've done, because that would be very helpful to me. Yeah, Leo, Chapter 7. Go to Chapter 7. Chapter 7, seven. all right. That's going to be the, the art of the edit. So I talk a lot about uh, the editing process there. Choose well, and you can be, and be the best you can be. Yeah, and Pretty it's funny, much. because the editing process is sometimes so underestimated in, in its importance. And what I mean by that is you spend all this time capturing the image and getting it, and then you're kind of burned out in a way by the time you get back. That's right. You go you look at it and it's really exciting and then after that it sort of fizzles a little bit. And you're right in the sense is you need help. You do need second opinions because we're so close to our own work. Um, and that's where it counts the most is making sure you're really pulling out your strongest images and showing those to the world. So Yeah, total total agreement, Catherine. I mean you could be the greatest photographer in the world and if you're a lousy editor no one will ever know. Exactly. But I love how you expose it. So here's all the shots you looked yeah. at, and here's the one you chose. And you said, you know, it's not perfect. Some of the kids' eyes are closed, but this is the one that, that captured uh, her, Flori Colobe, and, uh, and the orphans yeah. she looks after in Lesotho. And so yeah. that, that's what you were looking for is that moment. I love this one, too, where you say sometimes it's a detail that you might overlook. The hair, wisp of hair here, the bird over here. You have to spend enough time with that image to say, oh, wait a minute, yeah. Notice those things. Yeah, yeah, look for those subtle, subtle details. How often are you starting these personal projects and they're just not clicking for you? And if that does happen, what's your, what do you do? Well, I mean, I think it's okay to have, you know, various projects on the go at any one time. And for me sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm traveling a lot and wherever I am in the world, you know, I'll make an image in one place and for some strange reason, it reminds me of something completely unrelated in some other part of the world, but maybe it's connected aesthetically. It looks that way. It looks similar to another image. So, you know, with Lightroom and Aperture, in Aperture, I just take another album. I, if I notice I've got a lot of shadow images, I might just pop them all in one album. And occasionally I'll be inspired to just continue on that theme as a new project. So, you know, I, I, I'm kind of aware of all that stuff, but for me, the connecting the images together becomes the new challenge. And when you start to do that, it kind of gets you, and for me anyway, and, and in the experience I've had when I've taught, it gets people kind of inspired to really kind of seek out uh, images that will fall within the theme or project. And, you know, when you go out there looking for something, you might find it. If you're not looking for it, you may not. Here's people kissing in different places. Uh-huh, exactly, exactly. And but people will do that, Leo. They will, <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> yeah, this that is, top one. Is, go ahead, this top one here. This is oh, New yeah, York. Oh, yeah, that was, like. uh, yeah. yeah, Times Square 2000. I, you can't tell, but I was freezing my butt off. Uh, <laughs> it, in that one. It was I can very, see the snow coming down. <laughs> yeah, real, real New Yorkers know that, uh, you know, you don't go to Times Square. the last place you I know, <laughs> I can't believe you were there. This, well, this I just amazing. got there. This is great. We're talking to Steve Simon. He's the author of this great book, The Passionate Photographer, 10 Steps, Steps Towards Becoming Great. SteveSimonPhoto.com is his website. And let's just take a little break. We'll come back and talk more with uh, Steve. I'm getting inspired already. I want to grab my X100 and go out and shoot. Before we do that, though, <coughs> can I tell everybody about Netflix.com? Would you mind if I took a little break here? No. You know, Netflix has separated their two uh, business divisions now into the DVD division. What is it called? Quickest quickly and then the streaming division which is Netflix because they realized and I think this is something we've known for some time that really the, the key to Netflix is the streaming video you can watch on your iPad your iPhone any Android phone now all of them by the way from two point as long as you got uh, Froyo or later you can watch great movies great TV shows on your t big screen TV through your Blu-ray player your TV your PlayStation 3 your Xbox 360 your Roku box your Nintendo I mean it just goes on and on documentaries I know if if you're really into uh, uh, photography, you probably really enjoy the documentaries available. A lot of National Geographic documentaries on here. Um, some great stuff for photographers, but also, you know, classic movies, uh, brand new stuff. I just, I have to say, this is the best deal in entertainment out there. Get ready for this $7.99 a month for unlimited streaming 
tens of thousands of movies. For the kids, it's great, too. Uh, I want you to take a look. Try it for 30 days free right now. Netflix.com slash twit. Netflix.com slash twit. If you're already a member, I know most of you are. I don't have to tell you this. I'm preaching to the converted. But you might want to tell a friend and help us out. Netflix.com slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of our twit photo show. Every time I look at this, I go, oh. I want to see more movies that oh, you want to see. Hey, that. Steve, what's your favorite movie? Do you have one? Uh, you know, I, I watch Netflix. I agree. It's like the best deal. We don't it's, even have cable, but we have Netflix. It. I'm not, I don't have this cable like either. This is candy. I've been the watching Breaking Bad. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. the documentaries are amazing. You, you alluded to it. There are so many. There's so many art documentaries. Mm -hmm. The last one I saw, I had seen before, but we had friends over there who hadn't seen it. That was Man on Wire. Oh, isn't that great? The oh my God, that the, was just the guy who, who who goes from the uh, by. He's a tight tightrope artist, and uh, he's a Frenchman, and he he crossed from uh, the two towers in the World Trade Center. Insane! It, it, was, it was just an amazing Philippe movie Petit. because yeah, they had they had footage of him. I guess they must have been making a movie when he was young, so they were able to incorporate mm -hmm. that with the storytelling, and of course, you know, with what has happened, it just becomes. You know, that's that much more evocative. But, yeah, yeah, it was an amazing... I think, didn't it win the Academy Award? It did. Uh, best documentary. And, boy, I, I've seen it several times. I agree with you. I love the documentaries because you don't normally get those. You know, you don't see them in the theaters. No. Yeah. And uh, so it's really fun to go back and find... And you learn so much. Anyway, we don't have to plug Netflix anymore. Ne uh, I think you I think you get it. Netflix.com slash <laughs> uh, really is, is uh, really fantastic. Look at this picture of uh, President Obama. That was a That was a good convention to be at. It, it was. It was, it was pretty amazing. I mean, I had gone to the convention in New York in 2004, which was amazing, too, because just because there was so much action. I mean, was, yeah. New York was not the place where Republicans were all that welcomed. Right. But 2008, I went to both conventions. So it was very interesting to see uh, the differences and the similarities. Um, you know, in, in many ways, uh, the process was very similar. And and sometimes you couldn't really tell, I mean, you couldn't really tell from the pictures who might be a Republican or a Democrat. This I love because you said, you, you know, you can't always guarantee you've got the best position. You were shooting right into that big spotlight over Pre President Clinton's shoulder, but you made something of it. I tell you, boy, did you make something of it. That's an amazing shot. Did you know when you got this? Oh, yeah, well, this, this is one of those, those times when, uh, you know, technically speaking, I usually configure my camera so that I can just press the function button take a quick spot metering off Mr. Clinton's or President Clinton's face uh, and then lock that in and shoot so I don't, you know, many ways to get at it, but I need to be quick. So, so, so technically, you know, that's what I needed to do. And sure, this, the automatic, your program on this camera is not going to get this shot. No, as good as the matrix metering is on the Nikons, it's, it's going to underexpose. So you got to sort of, again, that's with experience. And, and, you know, you know that the life is so fleeting that you try not to miss too many of those moments because they don't happen again. That's right. You shoot a, a Nikon uh, D3? Uh, yeah, I, I use a D3 series. I've got the D3S now, which uh, is an amazing camera. It goes up to... 102,000 ISO in the high boost <laughs> mode, which I, I heard. It's not my line, but someone said it's the first camera that lets you take a decent shot of the inside of your lens cap. <laughs> <laughs> when we were in, and it's uh, probably true. When we were in Tasmania, uh, Michael Olin had the very first uh, D3, and we were looking. At, you were there. Uh, you weren't actually there. We were looking at penguins, and they were lit by a, a, a flashlight. And I'm stuck there with my 5D. There's no shot for oh, me. Oh, no. And he was able to get a shot. It just pissed me off. He was able to shoot <laughs> stuff from the dome light of the car. I mean, it's just amazing what they, what they do. And I think for photojournalists, uh, do you like the Nikon because of the, uh, of the uh, focus, fast focus, the high-quality focus? Or what is it that you're yeah. – is that well, it? Well, I, I, I think for me, Leo, it, it's, it's kind of been um, – you know, I've always been a Nikon guy. I've stuck with them, you know, since the beginning. You develop those pa those passions early on, don't you? Yeah, you do. And and again, the camera needs to feel good in your hands. It needs to be second nature. And you know, as new models are introduced, it's more of a evolution than revolution. So it feels familiar. You know, a new camera feels familiar right from the the get go. So you know, that's part of the reason. And of course, the the Nikon optics. I've always been a a big uh, advocate of, of the lenses right as well. So here's another yeah, so. here's another series from uh, the book The Passionate Photographer. Your very very famous picture of the giant cow, <laughs> which everybody has seen by now, right? Uh, yes. But I love it that you show. This is from the chapter Work on It. 
You show all the angles you shot of that damn giant cow. I know. I think that because you think that when you see that photo, you were like, "Did he just walk up to that?" And the girl just happened to be there. How mm. long did it take you to get that shot, time-wise? Yeah. yeah, you know, I I can't recall exactly. As a matter of fact, um, I can't recall exactly what when in the process it, it happened. But certainly, you know, I I this was a little bit different in this in, in that I sort of gave myself the day there, and I just decided that I would, you know, shoot as many different kinds of images as I could and, you know, put them all together as a kind of a mosaic of this giant cow, Salem Sioux, in <laughs> North Dakota. And, uh, you know, it's just... It's a great I montage. Love I, yeah. I love traveling through the States because you never know. I mean... There's great I stuff, shake, isn't there? It's just amazing. I shake my head a couple of times, and then, yeah, that is a cow. And then, <laughs> that is I realized a exactly ginormous that. cow. <laughs> I love it. I also love how how uh, you're you're able to, in this book to share your process, which really helps for those of us who are not as good uh, with the eye. You, you know, here's the shots of this woman with a with a giant plant on her head, and you and and you talk about why you picked this shot, and uh, I think that's just very valuable. Well, the cow photo actually leads us seamlessly into his tips if we want to... Let's do the tips. Do the tips. Um, so you talked about, you could use that as an example, but do the compositional dance and move in... Well, which one would go with the cow? Boldly oh. find your camera position? <laughs> well, do the, all of them go with the cow. Do the compositional dance. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, you know, you don't have to be a regular good dancer to do the compositional dance, which is fortunate for me because I am not. But what I'm really talking about is with your eye to the camera, kind of explore your subject because we know that a slight shift in your body posture, your camera position is going to profoundly affect all the elements within the frame. So you can kind of move, you know, someone's head so it covers a, a distracting element. I often, I give examples of, you know, going down low and raising someone above the horizon line, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it's a game of inches or even millimeters. So I, I have found that I don't always know what, thing is, what something's going to look like until I look at it through the viewfinder. So I will, with my eye to the camera, even in a portrait, I'll go in close. I'll maybe walk around to the side, you know, maybe even see what people look like from behind. That's my good side. But, you know, just to, to see kind of how things look. And then and then go from there. So it's it's really just kind of moving around. It's digital. You got nothing to lose. You just shoot while you go. You you know you can choose to delete later on if you want it. But uh, in my experience, it's been a great way of arriving at a camera position that I probably would not have got to if I had not done that compositional dance. And you said you like to shoot wide angle. I do. I do. I mean, I have you know the bevy of lenses, but I tend to shoot wide because it gets me out of my comfort zone. I'm right there in front of people, and, uh, no kidding. and in my experience, it's, it's good. It's, yeah. it, it works out. Yeah. 35 millimeter, is that your fave? Uh, that's my kind of favorite focal length with a, um, with a full-frame camera, but uh, I'm an equal opportunity focal length kind of guy. I don't <laughs> want to necessarily single out one. Right. And, yeah. So another tip you had was find a project of a, or theme and dig deeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, again, kind of what I was saying earlier, and that is um, when you find a project, and I gave an example of a, another photographer um, in there, and uh, well, her name is escaping. He, she did this beautiful little project, uh, The Day-to-Day -day Life of Albert Hastings, and uh, it's just a simple little project. And when I interviewed her, she described how kind of at times it was kind of difficult because she was basically... Um, photographing this one gentleman uh, who lived near her in Wales, she's an American, um, Linda Vini is her name, and uh, I think you can check on that. And, and there were times when, you know, she's there and he's there, and it, it got a little bit difficult in that, um, you know, maybe you need to just take a break and leave. But she said you always kind of have to be watching and looking, and, and, and when you work on a project, because you've, you've already got some images for that project, you know what you have, so you know you don't need to repeat certain images. And that forces you to kind of dig deeper, look harder. And I have found in my experience that the process has brought me to places, again, that I could just not have predicted had I not, um, you know, worked it, so to speak. 
<laughs> I love these. <laughs> I'm guessing that's a pie eating contest. I'm hoping it's I a know, pie eating contest. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but on first reaction, when you first see it, you're like, I thought it was blood. You Did don't you know what happened blood? there. No, I didn't. That yeah. looked like berries to me. Oh, well, I guess I have a. Yeah. Blueberries I are actually... I jumped to the worst, right? <laughs> they're an antioxidant. That they're very really... good for the skin, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. And boldly, this is a good picture to get to that other tip, which is boldly, uh, what did I say? Boldly find your camera position. And by that I mean, because life is so fleeting, you have to kind of get out your comfort zone. And with this woman, she was, this was in Krakow, Poland, when she was in a, in a, a streetcar. And I saw her and I saw the eyes from the ad. So I just kind of ran towards her, probably scared her a little bit if she noticed me, and then just shot it. And, you know, it's sometimes better to beg, uh, you know, forgiveness than permission, that old idea. I need to learn that lesson for street photography because they, they, but I just got to do it. Well, what time are you asking for permission? Yeah, how late? Do you, <laughs> when, do you, do you ask for permission? I, usually when I'm being escorted away, um, you know, by the authorities. But uh, no, it's 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 really just a question of <laughs> if it's necessary. You know, if 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 I you know kind of run up and start shooting and then people get upset or something, then I oh sorry, the only reason I did this because you know it was going to go away. That was really my my thinking on it. Um, but you know, I've I've managed to uh, you know be relatively unscathed in all these years as a street photographer. Um, you know, I, I my motivation is pure and. You know, if someone's upset, I will back away, of course. I'm not going to take their picture. And, and, you know, there's plenty of others. Yeah. Well, I found, too, so oftentimes people are intimidated by the question. But if you just start warming up to them and shooting them, then they they, they, they know starting to get to know you. And then they would say yes when, if you had asked them initially, they perhaps would have said no. And sometimes so. people hide themselves and you still get a great image. <laughs> I don't know if she was avoiding your lens or just happened to be carrying that painting like that, but I love that picture. That is just yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you. Yeah, some in you know, some places in the book I have this lesson learned and the lesson behind that picture for me was or the takeaway was when those kids turned the corner, um, I stopped and I just kind of went on my way. And I realized that in my photographic life, you know, there there are some experiences or situations that are a little more special than others. And this one was one of them. And in the end, I kind of stopped um, when I didn't have to. So the, this image, even though I got an image that I, I liked, um, maybe there were more around the corner. So if you're in a situation where there's some good stuff happening, don't give up on it until it goes away or you have to go away or the light fades. I mean, that's just one of the takeaways that I've had. Do you, do you shoot uh, with the motor wind or the, you know, the, the multiple shots so that you get all these or do you shoot one at a time? I, I shoot one at a time, but I do keep my motor on. So if, yeah. if a situation calls for a burst, I'm, I'm ready to, to do that. But, yeah. you know, I think it's better uh, to, to kind of develop your timing one at a time. And, you know, if you're doing sports or whatever, then the burst That's is That's the idea. timing. <laughs> I just, can I just can you elaborate that. on how you autofocus? Yes, yes, yes. Um, for me and for a lot of photographers, and this, you know, I didn't invent this, but I've certainly taken it on. And that is using the back button exclusively. And I know that most cameras, Nikon's for sure, uh, in the custom settings menu, I actually have my, just to remind me, it depends, different on all the cameras, but in the custom settings menu, there's something called AF activation. And AF activation, um, when you're there, you have AF on only. So when I do that, um, guys, it disengages focus from the shutter release. So the shutter release, you know, starts the meter going. If I have right. a VR lens, it'll activate the VR. And, of course, lets me take the picture. But focusing now, by pressing in the back button, I focus on whatever my focus point was at. Oh. When I let go of the button, it locks it. So when I let go, I can recompose. Brilliant. If I'm doing portraits or landscapes, that's how I do. I, I focus on the mountain, and then I lock it by letting go, and I recompose, and I shoot, shoot, shoot. But the beauty of this setup is you have to have your camera also on continuous servo mode. So when I hold the button in, all of a sudden it tracks a moving subject. Mm -hmm. So if I'm photographing a mountain, I can just lock in the focus. But if I see something running towards me, a herd of elephants, I can hold the button in and shoot while I, while I uh, hold the button in. And it's going to track and I'm going to get much more higher percentage of sharper images um, when I switched over years ago, um, 
I just found it just such a more natural way of using autofocus. And the people that I've converted um, to that way of shooting and they've converted me swear by it. I've um, never heard of it. I didn't I, even know you oh could do God. it. It's going to change your life. No, that's, that's what I've heard. From someone from Canon was I like, want to do this. Can I do it on our, can we do it on our 5Ds? Yes. I'm sure you can. Yes, you can. And I, someone from Canon, I forget who it was, but they were like, they thought it was crazy that I wasn't using it. But it was just one of those things I didn't know how to do it. So I have certain things I always do. I always go into app. I, I use aperture mode. I use a point focus, so I right. I can I can pick what I'm going to focus on. And now one more setting I'm going to always do, which is I'm going to turn off the focus on the shutter button, and and mm -hmm. so you can assign it to a button in the back of the camera. You can, and and you know when you do it, you, there's a bit of a learning curve. And yeah. you know, as I tell people about yeah, this, I'm gonna get a lot of out of focus yet. shots initially. You I know, know, you will curse my name when you make the change and you forget to focus by pressing that back button. Oh, no. But eventually, it just becomes so second nature. Well, here's that an example. This would have focused on the middle part. Um, yeah, continuous. The drama sure. is here, um, mm -hmm. and that's what you. I mean, so I aimed my focus point at. Uh, her face and I locked in the focus by um, or you know you can also move the focus points around but let's just say I did it um, with a center point I, I locked in the focus and then I carefully you recomposed recompose. without losing that plane of focus you mm -hmm. don't want to move backwards or forward and that just becomes a little bit more so servo would need to be turned off for that to have worked right no no you keep it on continuous servo always see the oh, okay. beauty of the system is you always have it on continuous servo uh, for me the, the less you have to think the more you can react the the more shots you're going to so get so the back so, button is a lock it's not focus it's lock well it's it's focus when you hold it in uh, so for example if she were moving towards me and i held the button in and kept shooting it would track her and give me it. all those pictures sharp Got but it. by letting go after I focus once, she stays sharp That's and then the I shot. can be composed. Got and it. how accurate is that tracking? It's it's extremely it's accurate. It's probably very As good on fact, an icon. Better than your eye. <laughs> probably yeah. better than my oh, eye. Oh, it's than always my... better than your eye, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so with just... Nikon with Nikon the dynamic uh, servo They're really good. Uh, either nine or twenty one points. That's the right. sweet spot. So that's what I would use. So just to reiterate to the audience, definitely there's a learning curve, just like using a Wacom tablet. Like, yes, audience, once you do start not using curse it, you don't go back. I'm yeah. doing this. To, I'm going home right after the show, and I'm going to set yeah. this up. So yeah. people just need to know that they have to do a couple self-assignments. Yeah. yeah. So disengage the autofocus from the shutter so it's only the back button, and make sure you're on continuous servo, and then you're set up and, and kind of ready to go. Okay, so let's give, Perfect let's example. give our viewers a... This is not where that camera would have focused. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. no. No way, so <laughs> right? So, oh, yeah. um, hey, Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot. So we're going to give our viewers a, a quick assignment to practice this back focus. Okay. Okay. Yeah, how yeah. Can I, I, I want to do this. Okay. I would... Um, you know, let's let's make it. Uh, I'm all about photographing people, so let's photograph a person. Could be a relative, could be your your kid, and you know, do a portrait situation where you aim the focus point at their eyes. You know, the the window to their soul, mm -hmm. and you want to get that sharp. Um, you might want to move the focus point to their eye. You lock the focus by pressing it down and then letting go. When you let go, it's locked. You can shoot. You can slightly recompose. And then either you walk towards your subject holding, holding the button down and shooting as you go or have them walk towards you and, and hold the button down and shoot as you go so it'll track. So basically, you know, you're holding the button down and you're shooting and it's tracking sharp, 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 sharp. Depending what camera, of course, that you have, the higher you go, the faster the tracking is. Right. And that requires that the focus servo be turned on. Yeah, focus servo needs to be turned on. So basically, even though it's on, when you lock it by letting go of your thumb off the focus button, um, you're just not using it. You've locked the focus in, and that's it. But I'm telling you, the people that have committed to this and used it, uh, it kind of changes everything. And with time, it's kind of like riding a bicycle. You just, just get on, you don't think, and you do it. Um, it just eliminates one more thing. In Chapter 4, I talked about getting in that... Um, zone as a photographer where concentration is key and the less you're thinking about your camera and, and more on the subject uh, the better it is going to is going to be for your 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 images you have this great quote from Robert Rauschenberg who is, is not known as a photographer sometimes I have no. taken photographs and felt so excited I could barely hold the camera steady 
and the photo was boring. <laughs> that's that's true. Awesome. And that's, you know, I put that quote in there because I'm talking about the experience you have when you're in an amazing place and you're shooting and you come back and you're disappointed because you didn't quite capture whatever it was that you felt at the scene. And that is partly because you're not concentrating. When you concentrate, mm. when you're in that amazing situation, you have to actually it's harder you got to really concentrate mm -hmm. so that you do all the things that you do that give you good pictures by moving in close and mm -hmm. making sure your technical stuff you got to sort of take a deep breath and realize okay if I want to capture this I got to get to work I got to concentrate here's a great one love this well that's one of the reasons like I think point and shoot sometimes maybe easier because you're not thinking about Camera any gets of the technicalities out of the way. Yeah. you're just really focusing on on the X100, I've been leaving it in program mode so I could focus on what I'm seeing through the optical rangefinder. You're very directly connected to yeah. what you're shooting, and hope that I get it right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I use I use aperture priority. You know, if I'm using strobe, I obviously use manual, but right. um, I use aperture priority, and basically, it I don't think about it. All right. Mm -hmm. One more tip. We got a third tip from you, yeah. which I love. Find a project or theme and dig deeper, an inch wide, a mile deep. Yeah, I think I think I might have answered that one. Earlier. You, we were talking about it with your projects, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Basically, you know, it's kind of self-explanatory, but I I think if you can find something that excites you, that you want to go out and shoot, you know, that gets you out there because you've already got, you know, and and you get a couple of strong images, and that just kind of gets you more excited to go out and find something to add to the to to the series. And then you start to think, you know what, this could be like an exhibition or this could be a book project or, you know, who knows where it, where, where it will go. Um, think big, you know, I mean, it's, it's got to start somewhere, but you really just have to kind of start. You know, you don't want to be thinking too much. If you have an idea, get out there and see what you can do. And I also like the idea of having a project that can, can be portable. So when you travel, if you, you know, want to focus on aging or older people, you can always find older people in every place. Um, you know, whatever the theme might be, you can add to it, and then eventually you've you've got something really good. This is the Fly With Me project. These are are these flights taken on uh, pictures taken on an airplane? Uh, yes. God they were. knows we spend a lot of time on those damn <laughs> things. Be nice to have something to do up in the air. Yeah. What's your like? What are your top tips for shooting on an airplane? <laughs> Gosh, well, get a window seat. Yeah. For one. This is great. And I can't believe you got these shots out of the window. That's oh great. yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, this was one of those digital only things, and I, you know, again, maybe we're beyond the point of talking about film. But I never would have really attempted this project without, you know, having a digital camera because there's no loss. I mean, when I used to, you know, in the film days, you know, run around New York on a lunch for lunch with my camera, it cost me a hundred bucks. Whereas, you know, now, at least with the film and the capture part of things, we can just shoot and take right. chances and see right. what you get. Right. So, <laughs> so I would just, you know, always get a window seat and I travel a lot. And, and a quiet camera. <laughs> and a quiet camera. You know, I also, I also try and keep a low profile because, you know, I don't like to bring the camera out until right. everybody's sitting, including the flight attendants, because, you know, they tell you to like anything with an on off switch. Right. So you don't want them to tell you to turn it off before you take off because then you're in trouble. So, you, you know, using, maybe it's, go ahead. Are you using your SLR for all of these or do you use a point and shoot sometimes? What's the uh, balance? Yeah, for these I've, I've used all, all my DSLR and I've used it, you know, as the cameras have changed from the D70 to the D2X to the 3. Mm. But eventually, you know, you have, you have a, a whole bunch and I got to update this series because I've, you know, traveled a lot. So We all spend I've so actually, much time in airplanes. I love this because this is a time exposure. It is. And it the is. plane, the wing's not moving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but exactly. The plane is. <laughs> what, what lens are you using for most of these? Uh, most of these are? were probably my nice. bread and butter lens, which is a 24 to 70 uh, 2.8 8 lens. Uh, though lately I've been kind of having fun. I just got a couple of fast prime lenses, the, the 35 and the 85 14s. And on my, you know, Christmas list, Hanukkah list, I have a 24 1 4 that I'd like to get. But um, and this is this is the lens that uh, this is the lens you recommended as one of your favorites here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that's the older one. That's the um, the manual focus one. Oh I wow. Uh, but they've just wow. come out with a new G series lens. Unfortunately, it's a lot more money than that. That's a deal. But that's uh, a manual focus, and I can't trust my eyes anymore. You know, I've I've mm. gone into stigmatism. 
I don't know what's happening to me, Leo. I, I make noise when I bend. <laughs> uh, why do you say Leo? Why do you why do you why do you bring me into no. your pain? <laughs> I know why. I know perfectly well why. You'll hear that noise when I stand up later. <laughs> right. Steve, I have a question for you. You have you seem like such a warm, generous guy, and you've we haven't looked at too many of his, but he's done some really create like HIV stories and very serious, um, sad circumstances. How do you go into those situations and stay emotionally okay? And how do you process that? Yeah, I think um, when it comes to dealing with difficult subject matter, again, you know, having been a photojournalist, I guess that was a real good training ground for certain situations I would encounter. But, but here's the deal. When I make up my mind to do a project like I did the, the book on HIV called Heroines and Heroes, um, I knew that the stronger I could make it, you know, the more potential impact mm -hmm. the book and the images might have. And frankly, um, so I wanted to do the best possible job. And, and by doing that, um, it meant, you know, not necessarily shying away from some difficult subject matter. Um, this is something else that you're showing on the screen. This is Rwanda. Um, from, from wow. Rwanda. But, but it's, it's a similar situation in that, you know, the stronger you can make your images, uh, the more of an impact uh, they might have. And, and one thing that heartens me in this kind of oversaturated uh, world of photography, uh, that is uh, the power of the still image, because we still, we think in still images. And, and you know, maybe we're going to evolve into, you know, thinking in video. But the still image, you know, in an instant can communicate so much. And that's why that whole, you know, picture's worth a thousand words, where that comes from. So, so I, I, I guess when I'm dealing in those difficult situations, the people that I'm with, um, are, are in it with me. They know what I'm doing. They've agreed to let me into a very private uh, moment um, of a very difficult moment. And my responsibility, as I see it, is to just make the strongest images, you know, without exploiting. And, and I guess, you know, that's, that's a call that everybody has to make. But, but the stronger I can make it, the more possibility that uh, maybe something good can, can come from it. And how do you defrag after these experiences? Well, I mean, you know, that's, that's the thing. I think that uh, sometimes, uh, and we've probably experienced it, the camera feels like it's a bit of a shield, right? When mm. you've got the camera up, there's stuff that's happening in front of you, but you're looking at a screen. Um, again, I, I'm, I'm, I have no illusions. I mean, I, I've done my research. I know where I'm going. And, uh, you know, in the end, you know, I just, everybody in their own way just kind of deals with it. Um, you know, talking about it with my wife or whatever it might be. Uh, it's good to, you know, if it is, and it will affect you, to just, you know, have that uh, outlet so that you can, um, you know, just talk it through kind of thing. But, you know, the people are what's, you know, they're the ones that are going through the stuff. I mean, right. what, I'm, what I'm going through is, is absolutely, and that, you know, that's the other thing. I've been inspired, you know, by all these amazing people, especially on the AIDS project. I mean, I, I dedicated it to the grandmothers, and the grandmothers, many of whom, had lost their own children um, from AIDS, and were raising these little babies, and grand, you know, with very little, no complaining, so inspiring. Um, you know, it's so sad, but it's also been very inspiring in the end. You know, uh, probably more inspiration than sadness. Steve, uh, this is my favorite kind of photography, and it really is inspiring. I just, uh, it's, it's a ph photographer is witness. And I just think it's so powerful. Uh, we, you know, we talk, we, we, we have great photographers on beautiful images that are artistic images, but the, the idea of a documentarian, a photographer as witness, is just so powerful, and I just love it. The Passionate Photographer is the book, Ten Steps Toward Becoming Great. Stephen Simon uh, is the author, and this is New Writers. You can buy it right now. It's in the bookstores. Uh, and you also do workshops and well, lectures. We're doing a book launch, too. You're going to uh, do a book launch? Yeah, at v &H in New York. Um, the weekend before Photo Plus, I believe it's... Oh, good. Is that... Can you is, tell me the date again, Steve? October? Yeah, I think it's October 26th, yeah. which I believe is a Wednesday. Oh, good. And B&H, if you don't come for me, just come for B&H. Oh, a my great, gosh, I know. I love B&H. <laughs> the first time I went to B&H, I was heaven. like, this is like... Yeah, it's totally heaven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great to talk to you, Steve. Nice to meet you, and, uh, and thanks for being on the show. Thank we really so appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us, Steve. Hey, it's my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Mm, you make me want to run out and get my camera. Uh, John, well done. Now we're going to go I'll read your book. SteveSimonPhoto.com. And, and meet Steve at B&H in, uh, in New York.
Uh, we'll have the details in that and all the show notes. And, uh, of course, it's on the website as well, stevesimonphoto.com. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, guys. Wow, that was that's just so inspiring. Yeah, so cool. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, we appreciate Steve. it. Oh, is that is that it? Yeah, <laughs> We're free. you're free. I could play you a song. Oh. I could sing you a song. Oh, okay. No, no, sing no. You a story. Right, we'll, just do sure. a, we'll do another episode. Exactly how it works. <laughs> well, really so I'm it. gonna hang up on you, and then we'll do a closeout because I don't I don't want to yeah. bore you with that. Awesome. Well, thanks very much. I, I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. It uh, the time went by fast for me. It sure did. Yeah. It was really fun. <laughs> it always does. Really fun. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Bye, guys. And uh, thank you, Catherine, for once again bringing on another great photographer. I'll tell you, CatherineHall.net, if you want to see Catherine's website and her blog. And don't forget, the, there's a whole database of contests, by the way, in here. Yes. So you yes. can find if you want to get involved our, in a contest. Our next contest is going to be really, really, really cool. Good. I'm just going to leave it at that. Leave it at that. And who's our next guest next week? Um, next week we have Frank. From I have it here if you want me to read it. Yes. Frank Durhoff. I'm scared of mispronouncing his Dur last name. I'm going to say Durhoff. Yeah. And what is Frank famous for? He does a lot of fashion photography, people photography. Um, oh, we should get him here and you could just do a fashion shoot. Oh, well, he's in Amsterdam. So oh, like damn. <laughs> I think he's in Amsterdam. I can't remember. How fun. Um, How but fun. I'm super excited to have him on. He does a lot of educational work with Kelby and he's a really good teacher and he's a great photographer. And we'll talk about fashion and shooting. He's great with light so for all those light enthusiasts out there i think we'll definitely touch on that a lot next week next week so. we do this show every thursday 1 30 i'm sorry tuesday <laughs> what day is today tuesday 1 30 pacific 4 30 eastern time and that would be 20 30 utc at live uh, actually you could go to live.twit.tv but just twit.tv will take you there as well and if you do miss the show or if you haven't seen all the episodes because uh, we have some really amazing episodes yeah now we on the do camera. Go to uh, twit.tv and look at the photo. Uh, twit.tv slash photos, direct way to go there. Or click the show's link and you can find it there. And look at all the previous shows. Subscribe so you get every one of them. There's just some great stuff. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Leo. Great Thanks to see everyone. you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks and we'll see you next us. time on Twitch Photo. Bye-bye. <laughs>